Well, before communion tonight, to prepare our hearts, I thought we'd pick up with Dory. Where are you? I saw you come in. There you are. Dory, that was such a good question last week. I decided to make it one of my devotional studies, and I thought I'd, I'd share that with you tonight. So let's open our Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 13, and we're looking at prophets, uh, good and bad, and uh, learning some lessons from their life, because every chapter of the 1189 in the Scriptures are fruitful uh, for our digging through and finding truths that the Lord can use in our life, and every part of the Word of God is profitable. Um, just to, just to uh, help you, let's see, there we go. Uh, it, we're looking at 1 Kings 13, the, the, all 32 verses, and it, it actually has three wonderful divisions. But before we dig into what it means, basically uh, the first, um, oh, I don't know, 11, 12 verses, I mean, he is a man of God. And then all of a sudden he meets another man of God. And then all of a sudden he disobeys God. And then God summarily executes him. I mean, what a chapter. And, and what amazing, amazing lessons. But uh, the first thing is, uh, being a prophet does not automatically make someone a follower of God. I think in our minds, we think of the prophets as uh, these paragons, especially because it says that the church is built on the foundations of the apostles and the prophets. But there are actually prophets in the Bible that were not Christians, that were not followers of the Lord, uh, that, uh, well, Balaam is the chief example. He is the, uh, the bad guy that I mentioned this morning wanted to die the death of the righteous. He just didn't want to live the life. And uh, that's in Numbers. Uh, in Joshua 13, he's executed in the conquest. Um, in Second Peter, he's talked about as an example of a horrific uh, false prophet, Jude 11 the same, and even Balaam finds his way into the book of Revelation. So basically, being a prophet doesn't automatically make someone a follower of God that's saved forever. There are prophets who God uses that are not believers. And what all did Balaam do? Balaam prophesied in his third oracle the coming of Christ. And in the first two, he talks about the invincibility and the, the uh, divine election of Israel. So that's, that's the first thing I, I just wanted you to think about. Some prophets only speak words from experience. Now, this is what I'd like to take a moment to uh, go to these. Look at Jeremiah with me. We'll come back to 1 Kings. I just wanted you to find it, but come with me to Jeremiah. I want to show you something because this is so apropos for nowadays. If there are prophets in the Bible that do this, there are certainly ones on television today and the internet and everywhere else and all around us that are the same. But Jeremiah 23, 16, um, it says this, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you. They make you worthless. They speak a vision of their own heart, not from the mouth of of the Lord. So there are prophets who prophesy who are not prophesying from the Lord, they're just prophesying from them. And there are a lot of those nowadays. I mean, I lived in a town of almost a million people with one of those, who some days saw Jesus standing 900 feet tall, so you needed to give $900,000, you know, and I mean for his hospital. It was just the Lord did not prompt him to say those things he said because they didn't square much of it with the scriptures. But look in verse 11 of the same chapter, for both prophet and priest are profane. Uh, there was religious uh, hypocrisy. Yes, in my house I've found their wickedness. So basically what Peter says, their lives didn't square with their message. Uh, they were kind of like in it for whatever they could get out of it. And there was moral laxity. Look at verse 10. The land is full of adulterers because of the curse the land mourns. Um, it's just talking about these false prophets that are there. Um, and and uh, verse 18, I mean, I love Jeremiah 23 talking about the, these, uh, um, what God wants. Verse 18, for who has stood in the counsel of the Lord? That's what he wanted the prophets to be. Who has perceived and heard his word? He wanted the prophets to hear and perceive his word. Who has marked his word and heard it? That's what he wanted, but they weren't there. Uh, then look at Acts 20, because in the New Testament, we have a warning. 
that within the church would rise up these types of, of false, bad, uh, giving their own vision type of prophets. And uh, starting verse 29, Paul says, um, well, I'll, I'll back up. Uh, I mentioned this uh, when, when I introduced uh, David Kent uh, a couple of weeks ago. But therefore, take heed to yourselves, verse 28 of Acts 20, and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. Now look at verse 29 of Acts 20. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. So those are outsiders attacking from the outside. We expect that. But look at verse 30. Also from among yourselves, from within the church, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw the disciples after them. Now, specifically, just because someone is, is claiming the Lord told them something doesn't necessarily mean they're not a believer. All it does mean is the Lord didn't tell them that. We have to be very careful uh, and, and I say this just, just uh, for you to understand, just because someone's charismatic, you shouldn't suspect their salvation. Those two don't go together. They might have differing, alternate, uh, unbiblical views of things, but just because of that doesn't make them not a Christian. This would say these people would be believers from within the church in verse 30, but they speak perverse things because like Diotrephes, they want to have the preeminence. They, they are want to have whatever their goal is. Therefore, watch and remember, verse 31, that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and the word of his grace. And so there are uh, these prophets who speak words from their own experience, from their hearts. It's not God's revelation. That's been going on from the beginning. That's been going on from the Old Testament when there were the, the prophets that, that were all around. Of course, the test, and if you want to go to Deuteronomy 18.18, uh, 18, uh, there's a, a great test. Deuteronomy, let me, well, let me sh make sure it's really there. Um, Deuteronomy 18, 18. Well, it starts in 15. Um, Deuteronomy 18.15, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me in your midst. Moses is talking, and of course he's talking about Christ. And uh, your brethren, uh, him you shall hear. And the New King James even capitalizes the hymn as an indicator it's Christ. According to all your desire, the Lord your God in Horeb in the day of assembly said, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, nor let me see this great fire anymore lest I die. And Moses was overwhelmed, and the Lord said to me, what... They have spoken is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren and will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command. And it shall be, verse 19, that whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require of him. Now, here's the bad guys. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. Now, this is continuing. It gets even more uh, interesting. Verse 21. If you say in your heart, how will we know the word that the Lord, uh, which the Lord has not spoken? Verse 22. When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken it presumptuously. presumptuously you shall not be afraid of him. There were prophets who claimed to speak on behalf of the Lord who did not have the word of the Lord and what they said did not come true. And we see that uh, all too often nowadays. So just as an example. Now the next point, and this is something I think that the closer and closer and closer we draw to the end of days, the more we have to realize that just because a person claims they had an experience, just because a person claims that the Lord told them something, just because the person has the ability to perform signs and wonders does not verify that they are a true voice of God. There's only one authenticator. A prophet will always agree with the word of God, not speak contrary or from God in addition to. You shall not add to the word which I have commanded you, nor shall you diminish aught. 
as it says in Deuteronomy 4 and verse 2. So uh, look with me at Matthew 24, 24. And all these false prophet ones are fun. 24, 24, 13, 13. They're kind of like bookends, so you can always find them. But Matthew 24, 24. And we're differentiating between the good and the bad prophets. And in Matthew 24, 24, it says, For false Christ and false prophets will rise. This is Jesus talking. Jesus, who knows everything absolutely, perfectly, as God in human flesh said, that there will be false Christ, people purporting to be Christ, false prophets, people purporting to speak in the name of God, who will rise and look at this, and show great signs and wonders to deceive, and this is a continuation of all the, the warnings about deception, to deceive, if possible, even the elect. What it means is it's not possible to deceive the elect, to, to cause them to follow, follow false Christ and to be lost, but they're so powerful, and their signs and wonders are so convincing, if it were possible, it would happen. And so the Lord doesn't allow it to happen, which is really sobering. That, but did you catch? They will perform great signs and wonders. Did you know there's a whole band of Christendom that follows miracle workers? A miracle worker doesn't necessarily mean that they're a follower of Christ or even a, a voice of Christ. In fact, if you follow many miracle workers, they're not Christ-like. They are greedy. Many of them are sexually loose, if not immoral. They are materialistic. They are self-centered, proud, arrogant. I mean, no Christ-like. In fact, this morning after the morning service, uh, one of the college students came up to me and said, so, someone who's wearing the armor, what do they look like? I said, well, the armor is putting on Christ, as it says in Romans 13, 13, and 14. Put on Christ. What does a person that puts on Christ look like? The fruit of the Spirit is the personality of Christ lived out through us. And so that humble, gentle, under the control of the Spirit of God uh, demeanor is what an armor-wearing person looks like. And many of these signs and wonder workers are not Christ-like, and it's, it's sobering. But keep going to 2 Thessalonians 2.9. Uh, this is talking uh, about the, the uh, Antichrist, and in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verses 9 through 12, it says, the coming of the lawless one, uh, this is the beast, the antichrist, the, the uh, uh, lawless one. He, he is, has many titles uh, throughout the scriptures. Uh, antichrist is one of the fewer appearing ones. But the, verse 9, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan. This is going to be the final, I believe, Satan has always had his man in every generation. Uh, probably Hitler was one. Uh, probably, you know, Napoleon was one, probably Genghis Khan was one, uh, probably different Caesars were one. He always had his person that he was, he was grooming to be the world leader. But finally, God allows him to launch, and it will be according to the working of Satan, 2 Thessalonians 2.9, and look at this, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive, now look at this, the love of the truth that they might be saved. We need to always remember that salvation is kind of like, uh, you know, is it epoxy where you have to have two things and you mix them together? There, a lot of times there's only the emphasis on the one thing, that, that believe, call, do this. If there is not that other piece, the divine part, if there is not God granting repentance, if there is not a divinely put in love of the truth, it's not genuine salvation. It's just someone saying, Lord, Lord. See, that's, that, that is a persistent problem. People always say, wait a minute, how, come they, how are they Christians and acting that way? If they have never received the love of the truth, that's the only way we are saved, which, which is puzzling. What are these people that for their whole life say they're Christians and have no love for the truth? They have love for sensuality. They have love for witchcraft. 
They have love for materialism. They have love for everything, bloodshed, but not the truth. What are they? Well, look at what the Bible says. They have unrighteous deception. They perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Salvation, part of salvation is receiving a love of the truth. And continuing in verse 11, for this reason God will send them. They're not even saved. So he sends them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all might be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. You see the echo of Matthew 7? Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. You, you didn't love me. You didn't love the truth. You, you loved unrighteousness in your own way. And then finally, uh, Revelation 13, 13. And this is all just preface to uh, our fun little study in, in uh, this prophet. But look at 13, 13. Uh, this again is the beast from the earth. Uh, um, and he, verse 12, exercises all authority. But look at verse 13. Uh, he performs great signs. So he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Do you understand how overpowering this false prophet will be? That he can call down fire from heaven and, and, and the whole world is deceived uh, and he deceives, verse 14, those who dwell on the earth, the earth dwellers, the lost people. That's how God, all the way through Revelation, designates lost people. They are earth dwellers. They are living for the earth. The earth is uh, all that life is to them. It's like they draw their life from the earth and uh, that they live their life for the earth. They are earth dwellers, as opposed to believers who their citizenship is in heaven. They're, they're, they are pilgrims and strangers here, but they aren't dwelling in at home here. There, there's never a full feeling comfortable here. It is looking for a city that has foundations where their citizenship lies. But the earth dwellers, the, uh, those who dwell on the earth, verse 14, by the signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on earth to make an image of the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived and was given granted power to give breath to the image of the beast and even more deception and, and causing everyone in verse 16 to follow uh, so the false prophets can perform signs and wonders. Okay, now let's go to 1 Kings 13. And uh, that was just a background on prophets, but 1 Kings 13, real quickly before we have communion, is fascinating. Uh, Dory asked us about, she said, what's going on there? The first 10 verses, the obedient blessed ministry of the man of God. I mean, look, and I'll just read through this with you, starting in verse 1. And behold, a man of God. This is a good guy. Look at verse 6. Uh, he, he is the man of God, and he entreats the Lord. This, the first 10 verses are about a genuine, marvelous servant of the Lord. He went from Judah to Bethel by the word of the Lord, and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And you remember what happened. Uh, there was King David, then his son Solomon. Uh, if you did the uh, walk through the Bible, you know, Saul, no heart, David, whole heart, Solomon, half heart. You know, I mean, that's walk through the Bible stuff. And Solomon's son, through his pride and arrogance, split the kingdom. God actually took ten tribes away from him. And the northern part of Israel, Jeroboam took. And Rehoboam, son of Solomon, took Judah and the southern, uh, Judah and, and uh, Benjamin in the south, and then all the other ten tribes went in the north. And so Jeroboam is, is doing bad things, and if you see at the end of chapter 12, he, um, in verse 32, at Bethel he installed priests and made these golden calves, and then in Dan in the north. So he had two uh, places for them to worship his alternate. He didn't want him going to Jerusalem to the true and living God. He said, worship God in my alternate places. And so he got him involved in calf worship, and he altered God's word. He ignored God's word. Uh, he gave him, in verse 28 of chapter 12, a worship of convenience. He said, hey, it's too much to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods that brought you up out of the land of Egypt. They were false. He lowered God's standards. Look at verse 31. He made priests from any class of people. I mean, everything he did is just indicative. And so that's what's going on. So in contrast, chapter 13, a man of God from Judah. 
the, the true believers left the north when Jeroboam instituted this golden calf worship, and it says they all streamed south. That's why there are no lost tribes of Israel. Uh, British Israelitism, the whole worldwide church of God, and all the Philadelphia form of it is erroneous. There are no lost tribes, and, and they aren't Britain and their colonies. All 12 tribes were resident in the south because believers from all 10 of the northern tribes migrated south to Jerusalem. They wanted to be around the worship of God. And so one of the true followers in verse 1 goes to Bethel where the golden calf was and where Jeroboam was, and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. Uh, what's amazing is that altar, the golden calf altar, is still there in Israel. You can still stand there. You can see its steps and everything. That's one of the, in fact, they've rebuilt uh, kind of a, a type of altar that probably looks like it looked back then. But the whole steps and platform going up to the altar are still there. And it's amazing. And Jeroboam was standing there and he cried out, uh, the prophet did, against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, O altar, thus says the Lord, behold a child Josiah by name. Now look up from your Bibles. Josiah doesn't come around for almost 300 years. It's actually 290 years into the future. This prophet makes one of the most remarkable prophecies in the Bible. He prophesies the name of the king and what he's going to do almost 300 years in the future. And, and God gave this man of God the, one of the record prophecies in the scripture. He he was a man of God. He was blessed in his ministry. And you shall sacrifice priests in the high places who burn incense, in verse 2, and men's bones will be burned on you. In verse 3, a sign the same day saying, this is a sign. The Lord has spoken. The altar will split apart and the ashes on it poured out. So it came to pass when King jo Jeroboam heard the saying, the man of God who cried out, he stretched out his hand from the altar. And, and you can just see him seething with rage, and he points at him, and he says, go get him. And look what the Lord does. He says, arrest him. Then his hand, which he stretched out toward the man of God, withered, just became like a stick. I mean, can you imagine feeling your, the atrification of your limb? Can you imagine life with your arms sticking out? like an appendage like that, how you couldn't, you know, you'd have to back through stuff. I mean, it's just, it's amazing. And verse 5, the altar was split apart, and the ashes poured out from the altar, according to the sign which the man of God, see how man of God, this guy is a good guy. He's a true prophet, follower of the Lord, had given by the word of the Lord. And then the king, I mean, who was amazed, he knew what he was doing was contrary to God. He knew he wasn't supposed to be doing it. I mean, he has been warned, and now he's atrophied. And the king answered and said, verse 6, The man of God, please entreat the favor of the Lord your God and pray for me that my hand may be restored to me. So the man of God, there he is again, he's a man of God, entreated the Lord, and the king's hand came back to life, and his arm was returned then the king said to the man of God, hey, you're not so bad after all. Why don't we have dinner? You know, I need you to, on my side, you have the real deal here. You're powerful. And I will give you a reward. And the man of God, still the man of God, verse 8, if you were to give me half your house, I don't want it. And I'm not going to eat or drink. So it was commanded me by the word of the Lord, saying, you shall not eat bread, nor drink water, nor return by the way which you came. And he went another way and did not return by the way he came to Bethel. So there's the obedient, blessed ministry of the man of God. You, you, this guy is stellar, amazing, used to the Lord. Lesson, God can use a person in a mighty way. But that does not insulate them for life from temptations that can ruin their lives and ministries. Did you know a lot of times this happens? People have stellar blessing from God, giftedness, marvelous working of God through them. And it's almost like people think, wow, whew, they're just going to always be that way. No. It, it is very, very fragile. It's based only on obedience. You can do 
great things. This guy has one of the highest, greatest, most stellar prophecies, a 300-year-in-the-future by name person. There are few like that in the Bible. It didn't insulate him from, from temptation. Well, let's go to the temptation. Look at verses 11 through 19. The deception and disobedience of the man of God, uh, starting in verse 11. Now an old prophet dwelt in Bethel. Wait a minute. Why didn't he go south? He was a prophet. God identified him as a prophet. He's old, probably got complacent. He knew the true God dwelt, uh, hovered over the, the mercy seat in Jerusalem. But, I mean, he knew him, and he stayed in Bethel. That is a warning sign. This guy was the real thing. He was a, he was a prophet. He was an old one. He dwelt in Bethel, which he shouldn't have. And his sons came and told him all the works the man of God had done. In Bethel, they told their father the words which he had spoken. And their father said, Which way did he go? For the sons had seen the man of God who came from Judah. And he said to his son, Saddle the donkey for me. So he saddled the donkey and he rode on it. And he went after the man of God and found him sitting under an oak. And when he came to him, he said, Are you the man of God? I mean, the man of God, man of God, man of God. This guy is amazing. And he said, I am. And he said to him, Come home with me and eat bread. And he says, I can't. It, and he reiterates what God told him. Do you know what a great lesson is? It's not enough just to say what the Bible says. We're supposed to do it. You notice that he only said it. He remembered what the Bible says. He said in verse 16, I can't return with you, I can't go with you, neither can I eat a bread nor drink water with you in this place. For I have been told by the word of the Lord, God himself told me, you shall not eat bread nor drink water nor return by going the, the way you came. Now look at verse 18. And he said to him, I too am a prophet as you are. That was true. The Bible identifies him as an old prophet. Now, he was like him in the fact of the role of a prophet, but he wasn't a man of God like this guy was uh, because look what he says. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back to your house that he may eat bread and drink water. But he was lying to him. You know what a, a great lesson is? Fellow servants of the Lord can tell us things that God did not say to them. This guy was a fellow servant of the Lord, the old prophet, the one that shouldn't have been in Bethel. He should have left. He should have migrated like everybody else did that loved the Lord when the Bethel altar and the, the idols were put up. He should have been offended. He shouldn't have stayed there. He was complacent or something. But true servants of the Lord can tell us things that God did not say to them. It doesn't mean they're not a servant of the Lord. It doesn't mean that they're lost. See, I think sometimes we're too quick when, when people say these wild things, we think they're obviously lost. No, but they are deceived, and they are doing a disservice to the name of the Lord. Some of them are lost, but it doesn't mean just because you say from your experience something God didn't say. I think this, this prophet, uh, uh, maybe he was just excited to be around a, a real dynamo young prophet. I don't know. But we're all subject to deception when we don't stick to God's word. He repeated it, but he didn't do it, the younger prophet. He played the, I mean, he played his tape. He said, I'm not supposed to do it, but... Verse 19, he went back with him and ate bread in his house and drank water. He said it, he just didn't do it. How, how does it say the Lord says you're near in the mouth but far in the heart? Oh, that you would rend your heart and not your garments, that you wouldn't externally, that you would internally. The old prophet may have truly believed he experienced an angel that appeared to him and told him these things. But it wasn't by the word of the Lord. Maybe he dreamed it, maybe whatever he did, it wasn't, he was lying. The word of the Lord, it was not a prophetic utterance. So we don't know exactly uh, what's going on other than he deceived him. But even if someone sincerely believes in their experience, if it does not square with God's word, it's false. You know, that's so interesting nowadays that we even have to say that, but actually in Christendom, there are people, they say, well, doctrine divides people. 
Yeah, it does. Between the obedient and the disobedient, between the saved and the lost, between those who are going to face uh, uh, either the chastisement of God or his eternal judgment, it's so important to square everything with God's word. That's why the newest life group, their moniker is Acts 1711, that people didn't even take everything Paul said straight. They searched to see if what he said came from the scriptures. They verified his message against the word. That's, that's what the Bible says we're supposed to do. Okay, here's a lesson. God holds us responsible to what he has revealed to us in his word. It's not someone told me, and so I did it. God says you and I are responsible to obey what he tells us in his word. And, and look at the Acts 17.11. Let's just look at them. I, I quoted it, but uh, Acts 17.11 says, But these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. They weren't there to correct Paul. They were there to only take in truth. They didn't debate with him. They just listened held, verified, received. And, and that's, that, that is so vital. But look at Galatians 1, 8 and 9, and you know this is what Paul even said of himself. It says in Galatians 1, 8 and 9, uh, but even if we are an angel from heaven, sounds like the old prophet, an angel told me this, but even if we are an angel from heaven, Galatians 1, 8 and 9, preach any other gospel to you, then that which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. And as we've said before, now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel than that which you have received, let him be accursed. We're responsible to what God reveals in his word. And then James 4.17 is another one. And it says this, Therefore to him that knows to do good and doesn't do it, if we know what God has said that we are to do, the, the good that we are to do and doesn't do it to us, it's sin. So this, this is sin by neglect uh, in that one. Okay, now let's, let's go back to First uh, Kings 13 and we'll end it before we have communion. But this was just such a fun study. If you look at verse 20, the judgment and death of the disobedient man of God. And starting in verse 20, uh, now it happened as they sat at the table, the word of the Lord really came to that prophet, the old guy probably jolted him. You know, he'd been uh, lying, and all of a sudden, boom, the prophetic utterance came, and the prophet to the old man who had brought him back, and he cried out to the man of God who came from Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord, because you have disobeyed the word of the Lord and have not kept the commandment which the Lord your God commanded you, but you came back, ate bread and drank water in the place which the Lord said to you, eat no bread and drink no water, your corpse will not come to the tomb of your fathers, which really bad. Uh, I mean, everybody wanted to rest with their fathers in the family um, tomb. So it was after he'd eaten bread and after he'd drunk, he saddled the donkey for him and the prophet who had brought him back. And when he was gone, a lion met him on the road and killed him. And his corpse was thrown on the road. So the lion jumps on him, kills him, throws him down. Wow. And the donkey stood. Isn't it interesting? The old prophet wouldn't do what the Lord said, but the donkey and the lion did. I mean, the man of God, the young prophet. He wouldn't do what the Lord said. He altered from it. But these two, the lion and the donkey, acted contrary to their nature. The lion should have eaten the man and the donkey. The donkey should have run away for his life. They both acted contrary to their nature, but the man of God had not. He acted like his fallen nature, and so the lion stood by the corpse. And, the, and there, verse 25, men passed by and saw the corpse thrown on the road, and the lion standing by the corpse, almost like guarding it. Then they went and told in the city where the old prophet dwelt. And when the prophet who had brought him back from the way heard it, he said, It is the man of God who was disobedient to the word of the Lord. He should have added, Which I deceived him, the liar that I am. Therefore the Lord has delivered him to the lion, which has torn and killed him according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke. And he told his son, saddle the donkey, and he went and found the corpse thrown on the road, and the donkey and the lion. And the lion had not eaten the corpse, nor torn the donkey. 
Verse 29, the prophet took the corpse of the man of God, laid it on the donkey, brought it back, and the old prophet came to the city to mourn. I've always wondered, what was he mourning? That it was him that was the tool of deception? So the old prophet mourned and buried him, and they laid the corpse in his own tomb, and mourned and said, Alas, my brother. And you can read the rest, but look at verse 33. After this event, Jeroboam didn't turn away. He lowered God's standard, made priests from every class of people, verse 33, for his high places. Whoever wished, he consecrated. He just dropped the rules of God, and he became one of the, they became one of the priests of the high places. And this was the sin of Jeroboam so as to exterminate and destroy. What lessons? God requires full and complete obedience. You know, Dory said, this is a strange story. Yeah, it was an illustrative story. Kind of like Ananias and Sapphira this morning. That's a strange story too. Dropping dead. I mean, right in front of the prophets, just boom, like that. I mean, right in front of Peter, boom. God requires full and complete obedience. Selective and partial obedience is considered by God to be disobedience. Did you know that? 1 Samuel 15, 22. Look, look what it says. Just back up a little bit. King Saul, remember no heart, David whole heart, 1 Samuel 22. And, and basically, Saul selectively, he did fight Amalek, but he saved Agag. He did destroy everything, except he saved the best of, of all the loot for himself. And God said, destroy it all. That's my, my desire. Saul had selective and partial obedience. And God says it's disobedience. So look at verse 22 of 1 Samuel 15. And Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, that's all the external things you can do, as in obeying the voice of the Lord, doing what God says. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. So he said, the choice to obey is better than all of this burnt offering stuff that you can, you can just go through the motions and do it. Verse 23, for rebellion, now look at that. Selective and partial obedience is considered by God to be worse than disobedience. He calls it rebellion. And he compares rebellion to what? What does it say? For, to, for rebellion, that's partial obedience, doing it your own way, selectively picking out what you want and not doing the rest because you want it your own way, is like the sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness, stubbornness, which is almost a virtue in America. People say, proudly, I'm stubborn. Really? Stubbornness, verse 23 says, is as iniquity and idolatry. That I want my way so much, I'm going to persist and force it by all means. Stubbornness is like iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you. And Saul said to Samuel, I've sinned, I've transgressed the commandment of the Lord your God because I feared the people. What does he do? What sin always does. We just did that in Genesis 3 in the 52 chapter study. Sin always brings fear. Sin always brings guilt. Sin always makes us hide. Sin always makes us blame. And if you blame people, it's a byproduct of sin. If you're guilty, it's a byproduct of sin. If you're fearful, sin makes us fear. And sin makes us try and cover up like the, the fig leaves that Adam and Eve have. Well, um, here's another lesson. And this, this is so sobering for communion. Don't let others reveal or determine God's will for your life. That younger prophet let the older prophet tell him God's will, and he followed it. Rather than obeying God's word. That prophet had received God's word, and every one of us in this room have God's word. Don't let others reveal or determine God's will for your life. Instead, obey God's word at any cost because God said, I will show you the path of life. 
if you trust in me with all your heart and don't lean stubbornly on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge me, I'll direct your paths. What a lesson that Dory let us have tonight. Thanks, Dory. Can't wait for your next zinger. Amen. Me too. So this is what we're going to do. Let's all stand. And what we're going to do while we're standing is I'm going to let the elders and deacons go because we're going to roll right into communion. But as we stand, let's think about whether or not we have allowed into our life selective and partial obedience and honored stubbornness. It says that the wisdom is from above. We saw this morning from James 3. It's first peaceable, then gentle, then easily entreated. A true believer can be entreated. We can say, you should stop. And they go, I will. A ungodly person is stubborn. And rebellion is selective and partial obedience. Let's bow before the Lord. Father, we stand before you painfully conscious of our sinfulness. The light of your word, the working of your spirit makes us all realize we fall so short of your righteous, holy standard. But you have told us before we partake in communion, we're supposed to examine ourselves and see if there's any undealt with sin in our life. And I pray that tonight that each of us would do that so that we, with one heart and one voice, can worship you tonight at your table. There, no matter how many steps we've taken away from you, you've told us there's one step back. It's to repent, to say the same thing about our sin that you do, to confess it and forsake it and to know the joy of your cleansing. I pray that we would know that tonight so that with overflowing joy we can worship you at this table. Thank you for this bread, the picture that you took all of our sin upon yourself. You took the guilt of it, you took the blame for it, you took the punishment for it, and then you removed the record that it's ever attached to us. That's what you did, and that's why we've come to celebrate your death in our place. And I pray that you would fill us with great joy as we remember what you did for us. In your precious name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.